Gaywick by Vincent Verga. Publisher, Allison Books, Los Angeles, New York. Narrator, Eric Ost. On my bed was a new evening suit. I bathed and found Teo waiting to help me dress. All the clothing was new. On the desk was a small mound of white boxes, which we emptied one by one, studs and links of jade and onyx, a white silk tie, a white silk muffler, a gray kid gloves, a black silk top hat, and a key. A key? To that closet, Mr. Robert. But first, let me brush your hair. I never used that closet. We couldn't be certain of that. I unlocked the door. Inside hung a dark blue melted overcoat and a beaver lining and collar. A Christmas greenie was pinned to the right sleeve. I pulled the coat off its hanger and moved forward towards the door. Did you place my gift for him? There, he'll find it, Teo. I placed it on his pillow and instructed Phillips accordingly. Thank you, Teo. I'm fine now, thank you. Crossing to the desk chair, I presented him with his gift. He was honestly surprised by my gesture. If the tie was a fox paws, the thought behind it would lighten my gaff. Then I rushed down the hall to Dunno Gaylord. I knocked. He bid me enter by name. How did you know it was I? You're the only member of this household who runs. I blushed. He called me to him. Placing his hands on my shoulders, he thanked me for the paperweight. His eyes were full of affection. Uh, may I ask one question? Yes, sir, of course. How on earth did you manage it? We both laughed. I thanked him for my beautiful presents. He said they weren't really presents, but necessities. I laughed louder. It's true, Robbie. They're really just things you need. Uh, this is your Christmas present. He handed me a small velvet box. I stopped laughing. Uh, what is it? What an absurd question. Open it and find out. Inside was a silver buckle. I recognized it immediately, but dumbfounded said nothing. It's a wristwatch, Robbie. The newest thing. I went with Goodbody when he bought one for Mortimer, and then with Mortimer when he bought one for Goodbody. It was very funny. While I tried to keep them from buying the same one for each other, I convinced myself to take one for you and one for me. It's a wonderful idea. For a timepiece, don't you think? He showed me his. It was the same as mine. I managed to nod. Yes, it's the one I like best. I hope you don't mind. I started to cry. I wanted to mask my startling response to his generosity by sitting down, but every space was covered with elaborately wrapped boxes. I crossed the room and stood my back to him. What the devil are these? I sputtered, alarmed by the sobs I still felt rising in my throat. They're mine, from business associates, friends, employees. I saw his reflection in the mirror approaching me from behind. He looked glorious, a beneficent angel. I turned, he opened his arms, I fell against him. My tears spilled. Uh, what's wrong? What have I done? Happy. I'm so happy. He hugged me to him. You're too good to me, I whispered, call me. I'll never be able to love you enough. He stiffened. I could feel his entire body remove itself from mine. I straightened, freeing myself from his support. I read reproach in his cold gray eyes and waited for him to speak, repenting what I had said, fearing he would cease to respect me. I'll help you into your coat, Robert. It took 15 minutes by sled for us to reach our destination. During the ride to 30th Street on Murray Hill at Lexington Avenue, his mood lightened. The introspective tension gave way. The sweet temper of our shopping expedition was restored. Feeling the moment, I apologized for embarrassing him. Your candor startles me, Robbie. It always catches me off guard. But why are you on guard? It's the way I am. It's the way I've always been. It's a fascinating style. Catching my relieved grin, he smiled and took my hand briefly to squeeze it. The sudden pressure forced me into a clenching silence as tears of gratitude threatened again. I must not rend the tender calm in his eyes. The front door of the brownstone house was opened by Goodbody himself. 
He wore a red and green velvet smoking jacket, and a sprig of holly was stuck in his blonde hair. Thank God you come! I have given all to keep him from shredding the wrappings. Hey, hello, Robbie. Oh, welcome. How is he? Dunno asked, amused. Nine holes! Has he discovered anything? Only that you've wisely had everything double wrapped. The Black Prince is having a nervous collapse. On the telephone, he intimated you were giving way to fever? I imagine. I handed him packages, beautifully wrapped by Teo, and he giggled like a young boy, thanking me several times before turning us over to Kato, a tall black servant who divested us of our winter trappings while his employer closely examined my gifts for clues. An unearthly, high-pitched voice screeched welcome several times as we entered the front parlor. He was quite a working vocabulary, Dunno said it to me enthusiastically. He comes when called, he sings, he dances, he laughs, he... He's beautiful, I interrupted quite sincerely. A great white cockatoo perched in an enormous metal cage on a table near the fireplace. An overstuffed Victorian red velvet satay, and on the American antiques that covered shelves and tables, seven Persian cats with various markings set at degrees of petrified attention around the ivory-colored room. A child's fantasy, Christmas tree, bedecked and twinkling, stood to the right of the fireplace. Dozens of gifts littered the room, most bearing a huge G or a huge M. One of Monet's morning Rouen cathedrals hung over the mantel. An elaborately wrapped bundle, large as the celebrants, stood in the alcove in front of the bay windows. Mortimer, garbed in a blue silk Japanese kimono, waited. Uh, greetings, friends. Seasonal and otherwise. Uh, those aren't more gifts in your grubby paws, good body. They're from Robbie. Thank you, Petite. As always, you look superb, I thanked him. There was a long, calm silence. This was not at all what I had expected. Good body offered us a drink. We accepted some port. It is certainly big, I said eager for some fun, nodding in the direction of the alcove. Uh, Dunno settled on the couch between two cats. He's been crazed, Goodbody began sighing. It's been an agony. For more? Hello, 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 drop dead. Ha 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 ha. Dunno apologized for the bird's rudeness. Uh, we can't keep him, Donnie. He's gorgeous, but we can't. Oh, what a shame, I exclaimed to Dunno. Then there's no point to the other gift. I'll have it picked up in the morning, he answered, softly while our host gapped at one another. May I have more port, please? Each time the bird twitched a muscle or fluffed a feather, the cat stirred. When he opened his coxcomb, one began to growl. I'll take the bird, Tano continued. You'll take him? Good body asked, amazed. Yes, I'll take him. I've always wanted a cockatoo. Why you haven't? <laughs> why haven't you bought yourself one? I asked, wondering if he always took such an indirect route to satisfy his desires. He shrugged, verbalizing as an afterthought. The staff has enough to do. Ugh! Sod you, you bloody bird! Ugh! Of the cats went into a frenzy of activity, growling, hissing, and changing stalking positions. We all guffawed and nervously made certain a cat was not within climbing distance of us. Where did he ever learn that? Possibly from Mortimer while he was attacking your gift. Uh, speaking of your gift, in a moment, Eugene, let me introduce Robbie to the boarders. Can't that wait? Wait? Wait for what? I asked, wide-eyed. Mortimer sat on the floor near the package and started seeing a Christmas carol. Good body continued ignoring the reveler. Normally, we'd have to wander all over the house collecting this clowder, but thanks to Feathers here, they've all gathered near our happy hearth. From left to jolly right, Donnell, Patel, Zarzag, Zamai, 
Bethwell, Charmez, and Ragzel. Angels all. Uh, those two look like Kale. His brothers, Donnell and Zome. Zazong's his sister. She and Zome produced Charms and Patel, who managed the other two beauties. Uh, now, can we open? <laughs> no idea what you've waited for. Dunno responded. Mortimer whooped. Good body climbed over a chair to join him. With much hilarity, three layers of multicolored paper were removed to reveal a sewn cloth casing. Their moans of disappointment and confusion drew the servants who joined in the festivities. The cats, intrigued by the flying bits and balls of paper, gamboled around them. Get stuffed! Get stuffed! <laughs> Cats flew to resume their positions around the bird. Cato presented Mortimer with a pair of scissors. Among the cast, the oohs and ahs, the hisses, growls, and squawks, a gilded uh, Coromandel screen was unveiled. Mortimer cried, A bundle! Spun around twice and tumbled into the wrappings where he rolled and squealed with glee. Tremblingly, Good Body opened the ornate screen. The servants applauded. Dunno bowed his head, graciously accepting their praise. I squeezed his arm to congratulate him. Ruxil leaped to the mantle and stalked the cockatoo eye to eye. This is the most divine gift I have ever received. Ruxil pounced, upsetting the cage, sending six cats in as many directions and freeing the bird by springing Open the wire door. Help! Help! Ho! 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 Help! Son, you bloody buggers! <laughs> uh, Dunno leaped to his feet. The bird swooped down and landed on his shoulder. The cats, as though pulled by wires, reversed themselves and moved in for the kill. I had a terrified vision of good Dunno scaled and clawed by seven rampaging cats. A good body shared my vision, screamed instructions from across the room. Everyone, grab a cat! I caught Rugzil, the ringleader. Good body chased Patel and Zame behind the Christmas tree, which began to totter. Mortimer scooped up the furious Donnell. The able Cato clutched the hissing Chamez. The housekeeper scurried out of the parlor, chasing Patel. A valet grabbed Zerzak's tail. Rugzil bit my hand, and I shouted, dropped him. He squeezed under the couch. Zerzak clawed the valet, who persevered, still holding the tail. The housekeeper reappeared, proudly hugging Bethel. And now whiny, Mortimer slapped a hissing Donnell. Good body separated Patel and Zamai behind the Christmas tree, which began to totter. Mortimer scooped up the furious Donnell. The able Cato clutched the hissing Tremez. The housekeeper scurried out of the parlor, chasing Bethel. A valet grabbed Zerzong's tail. Ruxil bit my hand. I shouted and dropped him. He squeezed under the couch. Zerzag clawed the valet, who persevered. Still holding the tail, the housekeeper reappeared, proudly hugging Bethel. Now... A whiny Mortimer slapped a hissing Donnell. A good body separated Patel and Zomoy and lifted them at arm's length, one from the other. Dunno caged the laughing, clucking bird and carried him from the room, closing the door behind him. I stopped poking for Rexel when the others released their hostages. Ignoring me, he squeezed out from under the couch and groped with Zomoy and Patel to attack the library door, where his cohorts massed, howling for entry. This is horrible, Mortimer groaned. Do something, Timothy, anything. They are disgracing us. What can I do? I've already done it, announced Dino, re-entering the parlor. I've called Kateo. He's sitting in the carriage for the bird. Please forgive my damnable stupidity. Nothing to forgive, Gaylord. A little excitement is always delicious. Once cajoled and tugged away from the library door, the cats quieted. One by one, they reappeared to collapse over the arm of a settee, 
across the mantel or on a tabletop. Ruxiel curled in my lap. Zamoy stretched on the back of the couch behind my head. Goodbody and Mortimer opened the rest of their gifts and presented us with ours. They thanked me profusely for my trinkets and took us upstairs with great glee to hang on their bedroom wall. Danvers addition to Mortimer's Americana collection. A first printing dated 1 January 1863 of the broadside of the Emancipation Proclamation. Signed by Abraham Lincoln. And they saved their own gifts one to the other for a later private time. In a large hat box, Deneau found a model of an automobile. It's a miniature of the one awaiting you in Hanley's garage on 23rd Street. And Deneau Gaylord sat silent and still. I watched his color rise. Good buddy, he hates it. It was your ideal, Eugene. I should have known better than to listen. I think he's overcome, I said quietly. Robbie, do you really think so? Ask him. Adonai, are you overwhelmed or undone? He remained silent, holding the toy in his hands. Maybe we can get our money back? Is the garage open now? He asked almost inaudibly. What did he say? I repeated his words. I don't know, Donna. Is it Eugene? How should I know? Do I frequently handle his garage? Adonai rose and began pacing the room. When will it open? Please call and see if we can have the machine for a ride tomorrow. It's after six, I said, glancing at my wristwatch. Eugene, look what Robbie's wearing. We all compared wristwatches. It was the one gift they had exchanged as Christmas Eve presents. Deneau chatted with the cats. I think, Mortimer whispered, he wants his automobile now. I'm so relieved, good body sighed. I knew it was a good idea. It was my idea. Then you call the garage. Mortimer made an appointment for one o'clock on Christmas Day. Opening another large box, he presented us each with a pair of goggles. Phillips arrived for the cockatoo, and we all wrapped the cage in woolen blankets to guarantee Deneau's pet would not be carried off by pneumonia. Deneau sat in front of the fire, grinning like a child, caressing the miniature automobile. I opened my gift from the two friends. It was my turn to be delighted. I had always wanted a camera. I told them so. Everyone says that when they hate their gift. Blame it on Gaylord. Don't thank me. I had nothing to do with it. Do you no longer take photographs, Gaylord? I never did. I thought you took that wonderful naughty one of Jean. Which one is that? Of the one at the waterfall at Gaywick. I never took photographs. Carmack was the one with the camera. A thick, uncomfortable silence, settled as palpable as the curtain of snowflakes outside the windows. Forgive me, Donnie, for what it's worth. I, I don't believe I've ever made that particular error before. Uh, Dunno shrugged. Not to worry, Tim. You two had better dare dress, or we shall be late. I was amazed by the extent of their embarrassment. How in God's name could I have been so stupid? Good body continued. I think it's because I love that photograph so much. I, I want you to have taken it. How could I have forgotten? I've just blocked it out, I guess. I found the camera in my lap. The two friends left Dunno and me to our port. We didn't speak. I could see that the slip had distressed him. I left him to his thoughts. Mortimer returned briefly to hand him another package. I had it sent from Vienna, he said softly. A Merry Christmas, Donnie. It was an unbound manuscript. I read the German title page over his arm. Die Trom Dottong by Dr. Sigmund Freud. Mortimer remained long enough to say that Dr. Freud was causing quite a stir, and then left us again. My friend began reading. I sipped my port. He was withdrawn for most of the carriage ride to the opera. A good body and Mortimer discussed where the Coromandel Street would be drawn to best advantage. And then drew him into conversation about the unconscious, which I found stimulating. The subject was obviously very important to Deneau. When Goodbody asked if he ever heard from Dr. Mesmer, Deneau became quiet again and solemnly shook his head. To lighten the mood, I clumsily dropped the non-sequitur that Faust would be my first opera. Instantly, I became the center of attention. All else was forgotten. 
all that matters, Robbie, is that you have a good time. A Mortimer flashed his new silver flask and winked at me. I'll drink to that, he exclaimed. You drink to Jefferson Davis. The number of carriages at 36th Street was so tremendous that we four alighted from ours to walk the three blocks to the Met, joining the glamorous tide drifting towards the Fustafilius New York Society. People were far grander than I had imagined we walked in a cloud of variegated scent. I felt giddy, being in their legendary midst. A good body whispered in my ear, You ain't seen nothing yet, kiddo. He was right. Our box was in the parterre. The auditorium was full. I thought the theater beautiful, and Deneau agreed, calling it one of the loveliest interior spaces in the city. When we took our seats, people everywhere acknowledged us. This famed golden horseshoe was crammed with waving, nodding, laughing people, exhilarated by the prospect of hearing the celestial mulba. I assumed until Mortimer assured me uh, they were more interested in seeing and hearing one another. Someone shouted seasonal greetings to Deneau from an adjoining box. He nodded in their general direction and, under his breath, demanded that the opera begin. All these noisy fools are making my head ache, good body moaned. Everyone is here. Put up the cordon on a tear, Deneau whispered, laughing. I tried to read my program, but could not concentrate. I looked around me, realized anew where I was, and laughed aloud in excitement as the lights began to dim. My heart was pounding in my ears. I shan't hear a thing, I thought, when the conductor appeared. Distressed, I glanced at Deneau Gaylord. He looked at me and smiled, reaching for my hand. Just feel the music, Robbie, he whispered. I nodded, grateful and reassured. I felt the music. I rode the music. Its swelling and breaking reminded me of the ocean at Gatewick. I had no difficulty following Faust's bargain with Mephistopheles, and I spontaneously applauded the student's song, which pleased my friend because the young man making his debut was an acquaintance of theirs. I was so exhilarated by the end of the first act that I said I had to walk or jump up and down. I understood why there was such fuss over opera. It had everything. Music, drama, spectacle. I asked if we could come again. They laughed, reassuring me uh, there were more nights planned. Out in the corridor, an elderly matron with silver hair called Deneau Gaylord. We stopped walking and turned in her direction. She waved him forward with her fan, and before we were close enough for words, began scolding him for refusing her holiday invitations. She introduced him, as well as good body and Mortimer, to her three nieces huddled behind her. Her nieces seemed embarrassed. Mortimer, sounding silly, introduced me as Robert Lord Wright. I thought I'd misheard. The matron paused in her harangue and eyed me suspiciously. Had she misheard? Mortimer clarified for everyone. Uh, the island, M Mrs. Bingham, off the coast of Sussex in England, his mother. She composed her face and curtsied. The young ladies curtsied. I smiled wildly. Deneau turned away in horror and disbelief. Oh, your lordship, she said. How long do you stop in New York? I could not say a word. Mortimer took command. Oh, my cousin is here for the holidays. Is there any possibility? None, regrettably. Good night to you. This way, your lordship. I nodded. The woman curtsied again, and one of the lovely nieces glanced at me with a knowing smile that suddenly informed the charade with gaiety. We four fled down the grand staircase. We would never have freed ourselves from her, Mortimer explained. You think yourself clever, Eugene, good body sighed. But now every grand dame will be queuing up for an intro to his majesty here. We shall manage, he replied haughtily, stressing the royal we. I hope they wait till the intervals, Deneau said, smiling in spite of himself. People to the right of us, the left of us, ascending and descending on both sides of us, nodded or spoke to my friends. Men and women stopped to exchange greetings, invite them to gatherings, or congratulate them on some recent success. Each received a kind, courteous word in response. You're celebrities, I said. I'm bedazzled. Mortimer, get his grace, your cousin some champagne. 
It was the same at every interval. As the last chord sounded, we were out of our seats to perambulate in those splendid corridors and foreigners. By the third intermission, after Melba's triumphant jewel song, I was soaring with excitement and managed the hordes of eager mothers as graciously and efficiently as if I were to the title born. By the fourth act, I too was a celebrity. Marguerite's agony at her undoing moved me immeasurably, and at the conclusion of the act, I paused to calm myself, causing us to be swamped by visitors. The onslaught nearly ruined the evening for Deneau. I thought the lights would never go back down, and when the fifth act was finally underway, I noticed, as he handed me the binoculars, his hands were shaking. I asked, did he feel ill? He returned to look, expressing such discomfort that I hardly heard the last act of Faust. I could not wait to leave. Riding home, it was obvious that he was upset. When I asked what was wrong, he shrugged and said, If one becomes a, as rude and as stupid as they, one can only blame oneself. The decorated Christmas tree in the sitting room at Gramarcy Park, a gift from Goodbody and Mortimer, lifted his bruised spirits. Uh, the cockatoo's cheer returned us all to the festive move. Merry Christmas, Dano Gaylord! Ah, 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 Merry Christmas, one and all! M. Henry's supper triumphed. I could not believe the beauty of the pollard a la nava, a white glazed bird ornately decorated with truffles and green scallions on a silver tray large enough to skate on. We drank many toasts and sang Christmas carols until dawn. The event of Christmas Day was the ride in the automobile. We gathered at the garage and at precisely one ten, according to our synchronized watches, drove into the street. A horse pulling a barouche landau from the opposite direction became hysterical, reared up and kneed. The driver and gentleman passenger cursed us as we rocketed by at 11 miles per hour. Deneau handled the machine superbly, having studied exhaustively the maintenance and control of an automobile. We jerked and jolted along the snowy streets. Holiday slayers waved and cheered us on as we caused merry havoc among the horses with whom we shared the avenue. I was concerned about the speed and the noise until a fire engine tore past. We rode around the block twice. A crowd of spectators gathered in house windows and on the pavement. When we had ventured two blocks from the garage, Goodbody and Mortimer, uh, pleading the giddy vapors, asked to be carefully deposited at the curb. Deneau and I motored up to the southern end of Central Park and back down to the garage in just over two hours, leaving a highly entertained populace in our wake. I waved and laughed, and all the while, sustained a monologue on the glories of progress, pausing only once when a rearing horse threatened to kick me into an early grave. Back to the house, we found Goodbody and Mortimer seated in front of the fire anticipating Christmas dinner. A I burst uninvited into their midst, interrupting a discussion concerning Melville's passion for Hawthorne and babbled about the ride as the most exciting thing imaginable. For you, perhaps, my dear Robbie, drawled Mortimer. Uh, for whom the acquittal of Leslie Borden was the most exciting? Come, adventurers, ordered Goodbody. Sit by the fire with us. The eleven days of that sojourn burn fiercely in my memory. We attended the opera three more times. Nordica, as Norma, was sublime with her ravishing Custodiva. I needed to know everything about Bellini. And to know and I sat in the study until dawn, playing selections from the Sicilian's other works. The Travator was riotously exhilarating. The last evening, Tristan and Asolt proved the greatest for me. Lily Lehman's La Bastote left me unable to speak or move alone with him that night in the box. I could do no more than glance in his direction and raise my hands in helplessness, struggling to catch my breath. Understanding my turmoil, he dismissed the carriage and suggested a walk. In silence, we reached Central Park. He led me to the large pond on its arching bridge. We stood side by side in the moonlight as the stars shone above, looking more like a dory sparkling circle of the heavenly host than the familiar constellations. He spoke of his loneliness. 
You need someone to love, I said softly, boldly. I can't. I am unable. You loved your blood, brother? Yes. He looked at me and smiled, his eyes awake to the love his heart denied. I think, I said, in each of us is Tristan and his old. I think we all can be. Are able, if we dare. After a pause, he spoke one word more for himself than for me. Yes. When you are ready to know your love, to be transported beyond the confines and the supports of life, then let me be beside you, I said without saying. He looked down in the, to the frozen surface of the lake where the silver winter moon appeared captive. Large snowflakes began to fall. I leaned close to him and spontaneously placed a kiss on his warm cheek. That's the second time you've kissed me. May it not be the last, sir. He studied my face. I laughed, amused, and stirred. Why do you laugh? He looked puzzled. Smiling, he encircled my shoulders with his right arm and declared the evening ending. We walked in search of a cab. Neither of us speaking, our chilled breaths merged. We went to the theater, dined out with and without our friends, visited museums, galleries, landmarks, and other places of interest to the young and inexperienced. A good body of Mortimer, who shared a passion for New York City, had made lists coated by different colored pencils as musts, perhapses, and we like it. The two of us walked for miles, talking ceaselessly about countless things, all somehow relevant to ourselves and to our friendship. New Year's Eve arrived and a new century loomed, as the clock in the parlor at 15 Gramercy Park struck 12. A wee four friends toasted one another. A roar from the streets drew us to the windows. Deneau pulled the drapes open eagerly. Outside, thousands of souls danced and sang, hugged and kissed, while bales of every quality peeled. We grabbed our coats and joined the revelers. Reaching the pavement, I clutched Deneau's hand and attached myself to a passing line of people, skipping in a chain around the park, chanting amidst the raucous tentenbulations. Happy New Century! Happy New Century! Long live the century! Happy New Century! We danced with the others, intoxicated on the sense of time present, as time eternal. The circles broke, reformed, and broke again. Suddenly connected with Good Body and Mortimer, we formed our own circle and danced our private jig. For the third time, I kissed Deneau Gaylord. It was a riotous party. After we ebullient four reclaimed our fire, the indefatigable celebrants continued for hours to tumble by our windows, singing and laughing and cheering their good fortune and witnessing the dawn of the 20th century. I returned to Gaywick on the 2nd of January. Price Jones, alone, made the journey with me, and there were no problems. Brian met me at the station. He was delighted. Teo had done a yeoman's job on his list. He had talked at a clip of the wonderful time they all had, even though I wasn't there. I hinted at some goodies in my trunk, Frenchie's quickened pace flung us backward into our seats. I found Denver's in the Della Francesca study. He was not alone. A brutishly ugly young man with a large ears, the small eyes of a rodent, a spotted complexion, and a mass of lank dark curls set to his left. Robert, I would like you to meet Seth Jones. Jonesy, the boy snarled. I call myself Jonesy. He smiled, a um, mean, tight smile, revealing crooked, broken teeth. Very well, Jonesy, Denver's retorted in evident distaste. Meet Robert White. Now, get out of here and leave us to ourselves. We've a great deal to discuss. The boy stood, looked me over from top to boot, and smirked. His beady eyes remained impassive. Then he walked out. Denver stared after him with a face that expressed cold. Nothing. I had to repeat my question twice. When did he arrive? 
soon after you left, he said softly. Why? Dino thinks it will be a good influence. For how long? He didn't say. What's he like? The meanest cur walking upright on two feet. We laughed, but not for long. The catalyst had arrived. The die was cast. A Gay Mysteries Audiobooks I think it is easy to hate a label, but a face humanizes the word. So this effort is twofold. To offer comfort to those like myself that your world didn't end because you don't fit into the view of acceptable society on both sides. And in hopes of helping those with family that are LGBTQ, that it doesn't mean we are aliens from the child they once knew. Reassure them so they can maybe be supportive at the same time, being true to their values.